traffic to and from Columbus and the East Coast happens day in and day out with few of us paying any attention at all. But this lifeline of international trade defines our city as a critical port on the modern day Silk Road. We're happy to have such a well-versed panel to tell us more about the essential role Columbus plays. The complete bios for our panelists are in your program, so I'll just give a brief introduction. Our first panelist is Senior Deputy Executive Director for the Virginia Port Authority. He is responsible for commu community, media relations, environmental affairs, strategic planning, uh, working directly with Executive Dire Director uh, Jeffrey Briggs, uh, Bridges. Excuse me. Uh, please welcome Jeff Heaver. Our next panelist is Vice President of Business Development and Communications for the Columbus Regional Airport Authority. He is the liaison uh, between the authority and the airlines at Port Columbus and responsible for air service development and airline tenant affairs at Rickenbacker. Uh, please welcome David Whitaker. And to moderate our panel today, Vice President of Existing Business Services for the Columbus Chamber of Commerce. She leads the Chamber's initiative to retain and expand businesses in the 11 county region. Uh, please welcome Patty Huddle. <laughs> On behalf of the Metropolitan Club, our sponsor is Outlook Media and Morpsey. Please welcome our panelists and our moderator. Patty, here's your panel. Thank you. Good afternoon. Uh, it's great to be here today. And um, as Rich mentioned, uh, I work primarily with existing industry, and so I don't get to hit the road a lot. Um, so it's great to be with some folks who can tell me what's happening in other parts in the country and the world. Uh, so real glad that um, I'm part of this panel today as well. I thought I'd set the stage for you a little bit with just some statistics. Um, nationally, we've experienced export expansion for the past 10 quarters, or two and a half years. So these are really great trends. We're moving in the right direction. We should all be pleased, excited. However, the share of US firms that sell a product or good outside of the US has not budged past 1%. Brazil, India, and China are expected to account for 25% of the global GDP by 2015. Of that, exports make up 30% of GDP in China, Canada, and higher levels in India, Japan, and the entire EU. The US, and we locally, need to rethink our market opportunities to begin to close the gap on these figures. Unlike many areas, Columbus is blessed to have infrastructure um, necessary to serve international markets. Um, I'm gonna turn the mic over to Jeff first, and then to Dave so that it can talk to us a little bit more about the unique assets that we have access to in the transportation infrastructure. Um, so with that, Jeff, if you would. Thank you very much, uh, Patty. And I certainly appreciate the opportunity to be here with you in, in Columbus. It's a great turnout. I know I'm following the governor that spoke at the last meeting of this group. Um, and I'm not on my way to dedicate a statue to myself. Um, so um, bear with me as we talk a little bit about global trade. Um, the vision of the leadership here in the Columbus area and the development of the Rickenbacker uh, Inland Port, I think, has really been uh, phenomenal with respect to uh, trying to attract and uh, bring in additional uh, economic development and uh, jobs in the region. With the existing uh, 40 million square feet that are in the area and the potential to expand that to 30 million additional square feet really connects Columbus to the global marketplace both on the East Coast and the West Coast. Uh, you have great uh, connectivity um, to both coasts um, with good access with rail and uh, the infrastructure that Patty mentioned. But I wanna talk a little bit about um, how uh, the connectivity to Columbus through the global to the global marketplace through Virginia is a real uh, opportunity for both us in Virginia and, and you folks here in Columbus. The, um, the uh, project of national significance that uh, is known as the Heartland Corridor provided that connectivity from Virginia to Columbus opened in September of uh, 2011. That project would not have happened without it uh, receiving some seed money from the federal government. Many states uh, benefit from the, uh, the concept of the Heartland Corridor, but it was no single state was willing to put in the, the appropriate funds to make something like that happen. 
And so through some collective uh, efforts, uh, the federal government threw some money in at the beginning, and, and each state contributed, which led to some economic development opportunities for you here, improved uh, greater connectivity uh, to the Port of Virginia with double stack capability, improving the uh, transit time and reducing the, uh, uh, the mileage from, from our port uh, to Columbus. And I think that's uh, led to uh, the, the opportunity for increased volume through our port and, and, and through the Columbus area. Um, certainly the board of uh, the Columbus Regional Airport Authority um, has toured the Port of Virginia and has recognized the, the facilities that we have. Our port um, is currently the third largest port uh, on the east coast of the United States. We're the port that has the deepest uh, channel capability, the deepest channel capacity of 50 feet. I know everyone's uh, talking about the Panama Canal expansion that is expected to be complete in 2014, and I just recently served on a panel with the um, administrator of the Panama Canal a few weeks ago, and that project is on time and under budget. Um, ports along the East Coast that don't have the water that we have today are scrambling to try and achieve the water depth that will be necessary to accommodate the larger ships that will be able to go through the Panama Canal. Um, if those ports were fortunate enough to have those projects authorized tomorrow, I don't think time-wise they'd be ready and operable by 2014. So I think it presents an entirely new dynamic and opportunity for this port uh, of Virginia in the mid-Atlantic to be able to serve so much more of the U.S. population that is east of the Mississippi. And where we are today uh, provides a great um, connect connection uh, to that population base. Um, so we think that we're well situated going forward there. We have two class one railroads. Norfolk Southern obviously was the Heartland Carter uh, project and um, CSX also serves the Port of Virginia. And they're working hard to get double stack capability uh, with their uh, National Gateway project. I know they have a facility in Northwest Ohio that I think provides good access as well um, to this region. And we obviously have a shared customer base. Um, there are a number of shippers that are in the audience today and we certainly do appreciate you being here with us. But we also have one of our sales uh, reps that represents the Port of Virginia from the Detroit area, Jeannie Howman, who has brought um, with her some, some of our customers and I would like to recognize them um, we have uh, Franklin International. We certainly appreciate it. I was talking to that young lady before. She said she has some freight that moves through Virginia and New York. She wished it all came through Virginia. Right. <laughs> um, Hyper Logistics, we certainly appreciate your business, and he has uh, great connectivity, connections with Virginia. He's a VMI graduate. Um, uh, Emerson is here, and uh, United Shipper Association also. Thank you very much. Lansing Trade and uh, Globe Express. We certainly uh, appreciate that, and I know there's some others of you in the audience. Um, and frankly, uh, Greg Edwards is here with our team as well. He and I had a business meeting uh, this morning with some folks uh, from the Columbus area that we think could lead to some other opportunities for us in Virginia. Um, the Port of Virginia, um, with the rail connections that we have with you uh, here, and the development opportunities that exist uh, in, this, uh, in, this, in this part of uh, the nation and the ability to serve so much of uh, the population is, a, is an opportunity that we've capitalized on thus far. We've had about a year and a half under our belt with this new um, uh, rail connection, the Heartland Corridor. And I think um, going forward with larger ships coming to the east coast of the United States, there'll be more opportunities to see that uh, continue to grow and evolve. And I can say that while I'm delighted to be here today, the Virginia Port Authority certainly wants to come back to this market and uh, provide a little more um, direct impact to some of the customers and business communities that are here. So thank you. Wonderful. David, tell us a little bit about Brickbacker. Thank you, and thank you, Jeff, for uh, coming, coming to see us here today. Um, I, uh, let me take a moment to acknowledge uh, our table here. Our president and CEO, Elaine Roberts, is uh, here with us today. Uh, our chief asset and development officer, Robin Holderman, um, is here as well. Uh, also uh, at our table today is uh, Jeff Zimmerman, the Executive Director of uh, Columbus Region Logistics Council, and uh, Art Macris, a Vice President with uh, Duke Realty, uh, our business partner of ours. Uh, additionally, Brian Schreiber, Mindy Davis, Carl Schultz, and Connie Tursik, uh, staff members that we work with on logistics and uh, uh, issues, uh, are, are with us here today, too. So I want to thank all them. Uh, further, there's a tremendous number of uh, colleagues, friends, and business partners that have joined us today, and I certainly appreciate all, all your support. 
Um, I do want to take a couple of minutes today and talk to you about uh, the Rickenbacker Inland Port um, and then and the, the vast interest there is in the logistics uh, cluster, uh, if you will, economic development cluster uh, here in central Ohio, and uh, the interest is profound. Uh, the first thing I'd like to convey, though, is that, it's, uh, that we're a global uh, uh, player in, in the world of logistics, and it's sometimes hard for insiders um, to realize that Columbus is, uh, has the right to be asserting itself as a global player in the logistics industry, and we do. I've had the great fortune of traveling to uh, areas that we recognize as uh, known for logistics from Hong Kong um, to Amsterdam, um, and um, and those we know to be great logistics, and I'll tell you that our assets are comparable, uh, as good or better, um, than many of those location, uh, locations, and the uh, concentration of assets in the Rickenbacker area um, is, is quite possibly second to none uh, worldwide. So um, it's right for us to be talking about that. We should be out in front of that and not behind that. Um, and so it's important to, to have that mindset as we go about the business of marketing our region in, in that regard. But a little bit about Rickenbacker uh, Inland Port. That's a, a marketing handle that um, we've sort of resurrected. Uh, the in, Inland Port moniker, if you will, has, has come and gone over the years, and it's fairly intuitive to understand that it's a, it's a port that's not on the coast, um, but a port nonetheless, and uh, has assets that are very similar to um, a, an ocean port. And um, uh, so uh, it's been important as we travel abroad to describe the Rickenbacker area and uh, central Ohio area to not just talk about the airport. Of course, I'm employed by the airport authority, and one of the elements of, uh, of the Rickenbacker inland port is Rickenbacker International Airport, a, a cargo dedicated 5,000 acre facility that um, is very important uh, uh, to us and, and um, a major part of our portfolio. Um, and so, uh, but the, uh, to talk about the airport alone was, uh, it was, it was the only part of the conversation as you talk to uh, potential customers and logistic providers around the world. So we've also been, uh, you know, talked in, and put under a, an umbrella, um, under the Inland Port umbrella, the, the Norfolk Southern Rickenbacker Intermodal Yard, uh, which is a, a four-year-old um, uh, state-of-the-art uh, rail truck intermodal facility immediately adjacent to Rickenbacker. It's uh, owned and operated by Norfolk Southern. And a great business partner of ours, and it's directly connected to the uh, Deepwater Port at Norfolk, Virginia, that uh, Jeff um, and his colleagues operate. So, um, and it's also the shortest path, by the way, between uh, a coast and um, and Columbus. Uh, you know, a little over a day to get a container. I, I like to say the containers are still dripping, um, <laughs> uh, but when, when they get here, because it's it's that short a path. Of course, they're not submerged, but. Um, <laughs> Uh, you get the point there. So um, the intermodal yard, a major uh, component of the of the uh, of the Rickenbacker Inland Port, uh, the airport I touched on, uh, a very very large um, uh, airport facility with enormous capacity for additional activity. The intermodal yard has enormous capacity for additional activity. Um, and then we have uh, industrial development uh, around the Rickenbacker area, including a proprietary initiative of the airport authority, the Rickenbacker Global Logistics Park. Um, so there's 40 million square foot of industrial development under roof already in the Rickenbacker area alone, not to mention the other parts of central Ohio that also focus on distribution. And there's room for that to potentially double um, as the market demand would warrant. So um, enormous potential and capacity for big boxes, uh, distribution of goods to U.S. consumers uh, from, from the Rickenbacker area. Um, there's extensive trucking uh, in the Rickenbacker area and in central Ohio. Uh, the industry calls that often road feeder service. So, okay, I've gotten my container to a place close to where I need it to be, but how will it get the last leg? Um, and obviously that's going to be a truck in most cases, and uh, there's tremendous uh, trucking opportunities and options and companies in town that can meet all the needs of, of, of customers here. And then the only uh, asset that is really out physically outside of the Rickenbacker area that um, uh, we consider part of the Rickenbacker Inland Port um, is Port Columbus International Airport. So it's a very common question. Uh, Rickenbacker is not the primary passenger facility in town, and that does make it unique. Um, it makes it a little challenging in that the primary air service with a lot of belly space, if you will, underneath the passengers doesn't exist down at Rickenbacker. All the belly space is up at Port Columbus. But the two are close enough together from an uh, 
uh, macro view that uh, they can be considered uh, one in a sense. 30 minutes between the two logistics providers serve the same customers at both airports, cargo facilities at both airports. Um, it's a sufficient uh, uh, explanation uh, as you talk about the airport assets in town to talk about the two um, and how they work together. Um, so they're really uh, uh, an air uh, product that o over two different platforms that, that, that does work for us. Um, so uh, uh, that does not mention, as I've sort of alluded to, the extensive logistics assets in central Ohio beyond uh, Rickenbacker. Uh, many distribution clusters uh, um, from Aetna to West Jeff to um, Gahanna um, and uh, Grove City, uh, among others. Um, and uh, there's a number of other intermodal facilities uh, in central Ohio, both by Norfolk Southern and CSX. So um, again, tremendous platforms uh, for, for the community. Um, uh, shifting now to, uh, to, big, to impress upon you the, the broad, broad, broad focus on this cluster by so, so many. Um, Jeff mentioned the federal government, um, and it's true. Uh, they're deeply involved in, um, in uh, investing in the logistics cluster. So not only the quarter, but the Rickenbacker Intermodal Facility, the, the rail truck intermodal facility that I referenced earlier, had uh, uh, both those projects had federal dollars in it. We have federal stimulus dollars in a number of our projects and hopefully some future projects as well. So. Uh, uh, the federal government is focused and uh, sees the value in investing in that uh, as well. Uh, the state of Ohio um, and uh, the various departments in, uh, um, and also Jobs Ohio um, has a specific uh, logistics cluster identified and staff to uh, focus on uh, what uh, economic uh, uh, well-being they can bring to the region through uh, logistics companies and assets. Um, Franklin County, Commissioner Brown and uh, Jim Shimmer are here with us today, um, deeply, deeply invested uh, for uh, going back into the late 70s um, in the Rickenbacker area and continue to be an outstanding partner for us today. Um, the City of Columbus is deeply invested. Uh, we've talked about uh, Columbus 2020, Patty and the Columbus Chamber, uh, the Columbus Partnership, the Columbus Region Logistics Council. Um, all, all focused on, on logistics and, and what we can do. Um, uh, I've mentioned some of the communities that are involved, uh, Groveport, Old Betts, Pickaway County, the list goes on. Forgive me in advance, uh, despite uh, a long list, uh, probably leaving some people out. Um, industry, as, as Jeff alluded to, is obviously deeply invested. We have some global players, some multinational freight forwarders. Um, and third-party logistics companies that operate in uh, regions around the world that also operate in our region. And it's a tremendous asset to be able to flash their logo and say, they're here, um, so they know where it's right to be, um, et cetera. Uh, so a, a tremendous amount of very deep focus by a, a broad cross-section of people. Um, there's also entities such as uh, Columbus Sister Cities International, um, and um, uh, Columbus Council on World Affairs, both who are represented here today, who have uh, interest in uh, the globalization of, uh, of Columbus and uh, promoting and uh, recognizing that, having us recognize that. Again, sometimes the toughest battle is in your own region to understand how, how global we really are. So a lot of focus, and I just wanted you to be aware of that, that number one, we have assets that are globally competitive, and number two, we have a tremendous amount of people who are focused and uh, want to bring well-being to the region around uh, that, that economic activity. I think our biggest challenge probably for us is to you know, uh, get harmonization with our marketing efforts. So uh, all these various entities have a, a proprietary focus as they should be. Um, and, um, you know, uh, I think that uh, the partnership in 2020 and the Logistics Council has the, has the macro. And um, so well, I, uh, uh, no fault of anyone's, um, but uh, I think the so things we can do in our best interest would be to, uh, to try to streamline our messaging and, um, and to try to uh, get on the same page as we try to influence those both inside and outside the region that this is the place to do business. Thank you. And actually, that'll segue right into a question I had, which was curious if you could both share a little bit about your international business development efforts. Tell us what uh, a marketing um, effort looks like within your organization. Um, sure. From our perspective, we have, uh, we have uh, global marketing representatives across, uh, across the, uh, uh, the world, really, with representation in Europe, Asia, South America, um, and uh, India. And um, our, our, we're calling on the ocean carriers, uh, give, selling the message uh, that we're open for business with the largest uh, 
for those larger container ships that are coming. We're also uh, working with uh, shippers, importers, exporters, uh, identifying uh, alternatives for their freight uh, to move through the Port of Virginia and to ultimately meet their inland destination uh, capability. Um, we've had folks out in the field like that for, for a number of years, and uh, we're overcoming, I guess, the, uh, the general um, uh, international understanding that if you want to ship product to the United States, everybody thinks of New York or they think of L.A. And so we have a little bit of an um, educational curve to get over. But I think um, as we have grown uh, from the early 1980s as the 30th largest port in the United States to the seventh largest port today, we've slowly been making some progress uh, there. And as I mentioned, we're third on the East Coast, and I think with some time, you'll see that ultimately we become the dominant port on the East Coast of the United States with this uh, outreach to uh, from our marketing folks. Great. We have retained a consultant that um, uh, has representation on the ground all the time in, uh, in uh, Shanghai and Beijing. Um, and so we have that sort of day-to-day -day coverage there where we're members of uh, associations and logistics councils. And um, so as we're at those meetings and, uh, and can uh, do some business development work there, um, we do have representation on the ground that helps us execute that. And over time, we've developed uh, um, a, a database uh, that has been very helpful in terms of getting our message out. So uh, it's many thousands of people who are uh, active and in the industry globally uh, that we communicate to minimally on a quarterly basis um, uh, as part of our outreach efforts. Uh, uh, and we travel to the region as well. So um, I'm on my way for a couple of weeks in the middle of April to uh, call on our customers again in uh, China, Taiwan, and Hong Kong. Um, and um, we've been there almost every year for, for the past several, um, sometimes twice a year, um, continuing to try to raise the awareness level. I've had the great opportunity of interacting when I am traveling with, uh, with Jeff's team globally. And they're deeply impressive um, and, and great partners and have their own network. And uh, we've even co-presented abroad. And um, they're, they're really masterful at, uh, at dovetailing messages and uh, talking about a single product. And it's been, it's been very, very helpful to us. Thank you. Thank you. That was a question as well. You mentioned having some shared customers. Is there um, an opportunity to increase that just by sharing more information and working more collaboratively together? Or do you think you've already got that pretty nailed? I'll take the first crack at that. I, I, you know, I, I think there's always room for improvement. I mean, obviously, being here in this community um, today is a, is another step in that di uh, direction. The, uh, the the meeting that we had earlier today uh, is another opportunity. I think the collective marketing opportunities are are pretty strong uh, going forward, and uh, with the additional um, um, uh, square foot square footage in the warehousing, I mean, we we need to work together better. I mean, th the we have two class one railroads and um, you know everybody wants to do it cheaper and faster. And I think if we uh, kind of work, work together on either end of this um, uh, connectivity, we'll be a stronger, um, um, we'll have a stronger partnership. I certainly couldn't agree more and uh, uh, we, we should partner. We should do, uh, to create leads. Uh, we should talk about our platforms together and the opportunity here in Central Ohio together and with a common message, so, absolutely. And one of those messages, uh, we had a study conducted recently, and they indicated that one of the um, attributes that the Columbus market has uh, as it relates to logistics is predictability. And so you talked about cheaper and faster, but um, being able to provide predictability and when your product is going to arrive and be shipped, um, would you find that based on your experience with other por inland ports, you would agree that uh, that's an advantage for our market? A absolutely. Um, Predictability, reliability um, is what I think um, shippers are uh, always uh, uh, striving for. And now that we have this, I think it's 36-hour delivery from, um, from the Port of Virginia to Columbus. I mean, I think people can count on that, and that is a, a reliable uh, delivery time frame from the Port of Virginia. So, I mean, everybody can work that into their uh, logistics chain. So as we grow, you know, we have an experience a tremendous amount of congestion. Um, and where we see it, we respond to it quickly. So uh, tens of millions of dollars in roadway improvements, um, the uh, enormously expensive intermodal facility to uh, improve the capacity, tens of million investments into, uh, into Rickenbacker International Airport to stay ahead of the curve, not to mention investments made elsewhere. Um, so uh, um, you don't want the reputation of congestion to precede you. You don't really often 
didn't get a chance to fight that um, or even debate that because once the word's out, it's out. And um, so uh, kudos to those that who have, have taken the, had the wisdom to invest and stay ahead of that curve um, and to be focused on congestion and therefore uh, the lack thereof and reliability. Um, we have to stay focused on that. There's still a number of projects ahead of us um, to, to get completed, but um, we, uh, reliability would be very important to us to continue to promote. Agreed. And I think it, it based on what I've heard, it is something that's um, an advantage that we have compared to other markets. Um, Chicago, for instance. I think um, if we were to talk about on-time shipments and um, departures, we could definitely say we've got a, a leg up there. So. We'll keep working on those um, talking points in our marketing pieces. Interestingly, it, it can be double-edged. I, uh, I, my messaging evolves over time, um, depending on the feedback from the other side. But uh, some, sometimes you hear, well, because you don't have any activity. Um, and um, so there, why would there be congestion? So um, that's not true. Um, and uh, we're being smart about, with what we do. And we just have to keep at it. Ask you to put on an economic developer hat for a little bit. Um, I've been reading that in other parts of the country there are communities, chambers of commerce, regional economic development groups who are actually launching export specific programs to encourage their local businesses to grow that part of the economy. Um, I know on our part we're going to be conducting an export seminar this summer. Um, we've got folks out on the road uh, domestically and internationally all the time to try to grow um, business as well. But do you have any insights, any advice that you can impart to me and the local economic development community about how we can support um, that growth in that economy? Well, Patty, uh, you mentioned uh, uh, we had a sidebar today and uh, that we're, we're attending the uh, International Air Cargo uh, Association's biannual uh, trade uh, show in Atlanta this year, which is co-located with the uh, Council of Supply Chain Management Professionals annual meeting as well. So under the same roof, we have these two great uh, logistics uh, uh, trade associations and uh, trade groups that will be uh, uh, together and interacting. So there will be access to both halls, if you will, for all attendees of, of the conference. And we want to be sure that, it w you know, we've gotten a, a larger space because of the proximity. And it hasn't been in the United States in 12 years, the, the Air Cargo Forum. Um, and so we've taken a, a large amount of space. And it, it would be very important for us to have the Columbus region be a part of that. And so we very much look forward to you know, Jeff joining us uh, down in Atlanta and, um, and to promote the Columbus region. Um, it's real important to connect Rick and Backer, which has some traction, uh, and Columbus, because uh, again, in the end, it's all about uh, eye recognition and identification. And so, and as again, the message, marketing messaging and uh, making sure that we're the person on the other side, no matter how far away they are, is hearing consistent messaging uh, from the region, uh, no matter who's providing it. So we, we need your help in that regard look forward to it. Jeff, in your situation, what's the uh, collaboration in your region as it relates to marketing and we we, we we work very closely in our area, um, not only from the sales and marketing side at the Virginia Port Authority, the uh, economic development uh, organizations in our region. There's a, there's a, um, a, a regional group in there, uh, the groups on the locality levels. The Virginia Economic Development uh, Partnership out of Richmond, the statewide uh, entity, we, we partner uh, with all of these groups in various outreach programs as well as um, the Virginia Maritime Association, which is like a trade association for the port community. And uh, often we'll go and do joint marketing efforts uh, with respect to them. And we could certainly um, be more than willing to do something collectively with y'all here in Columbus and you know, other, uh, other parts of the country uh, or around the globe. And it's just a matter of sort of taking that to the next level. And I think a, a forum like this certainly helps put that on the forefront. I just like to say something about exports. Um, exports is really what has been driving the growth at the Port of Virginia over the last couple of years. And um, we've always been a, a traditionally uh, a, a very balanced port, um, hovering around 50-50 on imports and exports, unlike so many other uh, ports in the country that are heavily dependent on imports. Um, when we had the downturn in the economy, we, uh, we, 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 we lost about 16 percent of the freight, but the recovery came back um, on, the, on the, uh, the import side. And we're exporting about 53 percent 
of our product today versus 47% on the imports, and we like to kind of keep it like that. Wow. So whatever we can do to partner, we're, we're here. How many U.S. ports do you hear that from? That's incredible balance. Uh, we, we would certainly welcome, um, you know, what comes in goes out. And uh, so if we could have stuff going out, it would make our conversations a lot easier. So we certainly welcome the manufacturing activity increases the uh, the uh, the uh, mission to uh, export globally, our Ohio made products globally, and we certainly want our platforms used for that activity. So now I'm going to see how bold you two gentlemen oh, are. <laughs> I'm going to ask you to step outside your comfort zone a little bit and make a prediction. Um, Ohio's leading export de destinations today are Canada, um, I think it was about 40% of total exports, Mexico, mm -hmm. followed by European countries, Asia, Southeast Asia, and South America. We just heard Jeff talk a little bit about the Panama Canal and what that impact will be on uh, the port as well as us, what that opportunity is to us. And I'm curious if either of you gentlemen would like to make a prediction how those destination numbers might change or the rankings might change um, if we indeed embrace the Panama Canal opportunity. Um, I'll, I'll take the first uh, stab at that. Um, with respect to number one and two, our Trading, your trading partners to the north and the south. Um, and I, I don't think the canal is going to affect that. I think it's a matter, I don't know what those commodities are going to those areas, um, but if you have uh, the European countries um, were in the third, third place, mm -hmm. um, I certainly don't, I, I would certainly suggest that the, uh, the Asian market would probably end up surpassing that simply because um, Traditionally, Virginia has, has been a European-based um, uh, trading partner over the years, I mean, historically. And um, um, not surprisingly, uh, when there were some uh, issues on the West Coast with respect to uh, congestion and uh, some uh, labor challenges, um, a lot of changes occurred. And so much of that Asian freight uh, made its way by all water services to the, to the, east, to the east Coast. I mean, still two-thirds of the U.S. population is east of the Mississippi. And as um, the economy continues to uh, rebound, I think you'll, we'll continue to see um, greater uh, imports uh, and export opportunities to Asia. And I think that the canal would certainly drive that for opportunities here in Ohio and at your facility. So I would, I would probably say that's just the nature of the, um, the worldwide um, manufacturing consumption, if you will. Um, so I think that would probably play into, into your uh, um, dynamics as well. well. You know, with the right economic shifts uh, in the right direction, our potential is uh, enormous, as I've tried to allude to today. Uh, tremendous capacity, tremendous willingness to add capacity where it's necessary and um, uh, a geographically uh, uh, and strategically placed, uh, perhaps fortuitously, um, uh, close to, cl you know, very close to, you know, half of the U.S. population. So um, I think Panama will help with that, and that's obviously capacity increase, and we look forward to that coming online. But even beyond that, the potential for this region is enormous. I'm going to um, close with some uh, statistics, but I'd like to invite folks to the mics to ask questions of the panelists. Um, and while you're coming to the mic, I'm going to flip to some statistics to share with you. Um, Jeff was asked, indicating he wasn't sure what our exports were. Uh, machinery was Ohio's leading export, 8.5 billion, and Ohio was fifth among the 50 states in this category, with 4.2 percent of the U.S. total. Um, I'm looking for uh, feedback. I want people to guess what this is. Of our top 20 exports, Ohio ranked first in the nation in. Soap, waxes, and dental preps. <laughs> not soybeans. Um, Ohio was second in the nation, not in soybeans, for glass, glassware, iron, and steel products. Um, Ohio was ninth, the ninth largest exporting state. Um, and let's see, Ohio merchandise exports were valued at $46.4 billion in 2011, an increase of 11.8% from 2010, but by comparison, the U.S. US experienced an increase of 15.8% in exports from 2010 to 11. Um, 
Since 2004, Ohio's U.S. rank and share of the total export market has dropped from just under 4% of the total U.S. exports and fifth in the U.S. to just over 3% of total U.S. exports and ninth in the U.S. Um, in 2011. So as we leave today and as I move on to uh, questions, I think we should all challenge ourselves to think about how we can take responsibility for trying to grow the economy and look outside our borders to do that. Um, with that, we'll open up for questions. Thank you. I'm Jim Rutledge from the law firm of Bricker and Eckler. Uh, thank you, gentlemen, for your, your efforts uh, on behalf of our communities. Um, I'd like to continue with this uh, looking into the future. And if we could fast forward to after the Panama Canal has been deepened and widened, and we have this mix change of both volumes and mix of imports and exports, what type of development do you see in and around the intermodal? Will it be different types of businesses? What types of businesses can we expect in that bright day in the future? I think uh, more of what's going on uh, there, uh, in, in my view, uh, distribution, uh, warehousing, and light manufacturing, I think, is the ticket for the area. And so that is receiving of, of globally sourced goods um, and, um, and distributing them both around the Rickenbacker area and in a much broader region uh, from, from there, from that central location. We would, uh, again, welcome um, any sort of uh, activity that would generate exports um, as well and um, then and, and head back out on some of the uh, assets that are coming in. But um, really, distribution, I mean, is, is, is the primary ticket, I think, for the Rick, broader Rickenbacker area. Let me follow up and just ask you, you said you had 40 million square feet under roof. What sort of time frame do you expect that's going to increase? Well, if you'd asked us a couple of years ago, we were, we were, we were bullish uh, on it. I, you know, I, I, it's probably going to take 20, 20 more years for that to, to fully realize itself. Um, we'd hoped for a 20-year target a couple of years ago, but I'd say it's probably still at 20. Who knows? Um, if it gets hot, it'll move faster. Um, uh, Robin and Art have the ability to put up buildings very, 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 very quickly, shockingly quickly, um, and they're chomping at the bit to do so. Um, so we're ready uh, as the market allows us to go. Thank you. Yeah. Hi, I'm Jim Coe. Um, your information has sparked a multitude of questions. Uh, I keep thinking them as, as I go along. Um, one thing, um, can you do a cost comparison with, because I would imagine what's competing with rail is traditional truck transportation. A container from the port in Virginia to our um, rail intermodal here at Rickenbacker, um, it sounds like it's probably an equal uh, time frame, about 24 hours, 24 to 36 hours. 36. Uh, so that, that being pretty much equal, which is more if, uh, efficient right now, uh, the cost per container uh, by truck or by rail? You want me to refer to one of these shippers over here? <laughs> Rail. Rail. Gas. Okay. Yeah. And okay. that's going to continue. That's going to continue. That's going to continue. And, and our, our, our prediction is that rail is going to be the driver for us in the Port of Virginia. It's the rail connectivity that is going to uh, enhance the ability to serve more of the, uh, the population. And... Um, uh, the reliability piece that we talked about earlier is, is a key component to that. I think the, uh, the, the, the prices of uh, fuel is another. I think the regulations on um, drivers and the hours of service will continue to add to that. So, I mean, I think it's all going in that direction. It relieves highway congestion. And then the motor carrier industry, um, I mean, there's plenty to go around. Don't get me wrong. There's plenty to go around. They're always going to get the, the, the last mile and the first mile. Um, as well as, you know, the, the domestic move itself. So th there's, there's plenty for everybody. On that note, I've heard rumors ever since I've heard about the intermodal center here at Rickenbacker that uh, for maximum efficiency, several of the rail tunnels in uh, the mountains in Virginia and West Virginia had to actually uh, go for a higher clearance in order for, uh, I guess, a double stacking of the containers. Is that true? That is true. That was part of the, that was the Heartland Carter project. Mm -hmm. It either raised the ceiling or lowered the floor. I think on 27 tunnels in Virginia, and West Virginia and Ohio, um, th this was an existing um, 
rail track that Norfolk Southern owned for the coal business. And um, the double stack containers required a, a little more vertical clearance. Mm -hmm. And there were some bridges, I think, that had to be modified, okay. too. But th yeah, that was, that was it. That was and that's all completed? That's all completed. Okay. And finally, you've mentioned a lot about speed. And it's occurring to me that a lot of our, uh, um, our food sources are probably coming in from outside of the United States. And I would imagine uh, a significant amount of that is coming into the uh, port in Virginia. What, what percentage of the freight that's coming into Rickenbacker is food? And then what, once it's here and it goes out for distribution, how far is that distribution net from Columbus, Ohio? Is it like a, a significant part of the Midwest or? I'm going to defer to David on that. Yeah. And, I, and honestly, I don't know. Uh, most uh, perishables, like you're referring to, actually fly. So if it's global uh, produce, um, that needs to fly. And we welcome that as well. Um, uh, <laughs> However, I will tell you that we're, we're, we're not bringing in produce into Rick and Becker International Airport at the moment. It's a target commodity for us, and uh, we're, uh, you have to make some specific investments in refrigerated facilities. We're prepared to do that, uh, but right now we're not bringing in a lot of produce. We, we, we bring in a lot of uh, frozen uh, fish and uh, seafood into the Port of Virginia. We export a lot of uh, poultry uh, from Virginia um, with uh, uh, frozen and, and reefer containers. But if you want to make that investment, we'll work with you on that. OK. Thank hey, you. Hey, we just got a, a, a synergy. Dr. Bill. Hi, I'm Bill Lafayette. I'm an economic and workforce consultant. And uh, I guess this is going to betray my ignorance of uh, the route that uh, these trains follow. But I'm just wondering if there are opportunities to work with communities along the route to build up business both here and in Virginia? Well, there are. Um, as a matter of fact, the Heartland Corridor envisions, uh, as part of the project, an intermodal ramp in the Roanoke area of Virginia, as well as an intermodal ramp in Pritchard, West Virginia. The idea would be to connect those parts of Virginia and West Virginia to the global marketplace as well. And the reach that you have from those particular areas would serve an entirely different market than uh, here in the Columbus area. Mm -hmm. So it wouldn't adversely impact um, the, 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 the opportunities here. We think it would enhance it. It would. Those are, um, um, there's very little in Pritchard, West Virginia today uh, for the global marketplace. I've been there a couple of times um, and to look at the site where that was gonna be built and this junkyard dog came out of nowhere. <laughs> 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 um, but uh, um, they have a long way to go, but, but we think there's an opportunity. And, and the one in Virginia had a uh, significant uh, legal challenge that was just um, uh, ruled uh, favorably by the Virginia Supreme Court, and that can be built, but it's all based on the, um, the economic viability of that business model working. The railroad would construct those facilities themselves and operate it themselves, and we think it would be an, ec ec an economic development opportunity for those, those two areas. Hi, I'm Laura Kaprowski from MORPC, the Regional Planning Commission, and appreciate both of you being here and the topic's so important. I mean, we're working on our Metropolitan Transportation Plan, and we also have an important freight um, logistics uh, report coming out later this year. But my question is, right now there's a lot of talk in D.C. about transportation. I mean, both the transportation bill and the Senate that's been passed, and we don't know what's going to happen in the House. Can you talk about, do, do either of those bills or, or discussions relate to, to the topic today? And is there more that maybe in Washington, D.C. that they can do to help us in this area? Well, I, I can tell you the last transportation bill was extremely helpful to us. Jeff re, uh, uh, referred to quarters of national significance, and the Heartland Corridor was identified as one and secured a tremendous amount of funding for it. I'm not uh, up to speed on, uh, on uh, the nuances of the current bill, but that, that's an important bill for us, and uh, uh, we have tremendous federal support in, uh, uh, in regards to that. I'll just offer the comment uh, and echo the significance of the, the, the projects of national significance. Um, the House is not advancing that sort of concept 
uh, as we go forward, it, which is very disappointing to me because we had one project of national significance that we delivered on time and under budget, and we were going to use it as a poster child to do another project of national significance that would really be meaningful for the growth, growth of global trade. But this um, is kind of off the table for reasons, uh, as this gentleman's logo says, everything is political. Um, <laughs> Who's our sponsor today, so thank you. <laughs> All right, Paul Astleford with Experience Columbus. I'm just curious, uh, what are the top uh, five or six ports on the East Coast? And David, how much business do we do with all the other ports uh, in, forgive me, Jeff, uh, but how much business does Columbus do with all those other ports as well? Number one is, uh, New York, pains me to say that. Um, number two is Savannah, number three is Virginia, uh, then it's um, Charleston, and then I think Jacksonville. So those are the top five on the east coast of the United States. I don't know how much they do, but this lady would prefer it all come through Virginia. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I won't, I Everything won't Everything comes through Virginia. No, um, I'll, I, I like to say I'll, I'll pass lead to Columbus, and so we're, we're as connected to L.A., Long Beach, as we are to New York and Norfolk, um, and it's really getting close to a 50-50 split in terms of the container activity coming into the Rickenbacker from the east or from the west, uh, which uh, it used to be 90-10 west, um, and now it's 50-50 uh, west and east, so uh, that's Norfolk at work there. And, and Norfolk Southern, I think, um, to, to David's point, um, Years ago, they were, I want to say, 60 uh, on the West Coast freight coming to the east. They were picking it up from a West Coast carrier, and I think it was 60 percent from the west, to your point. And I think that number has shifted significantly where I think it's about, um, about 80 percent east now. And the Panama Can Canal will push that even further? We hope so. Yeah. It should encourage more ships to pass through, yes. Hi, uh, John Kim with the Columbus Chamber. And as the research director, I hopefully have a more than basic understanding of your respective ports and competitors. But my question is, in terms of the combination of Columbus and Virginia, you know, how do you view that and who's your competition in that regard, other coastal and inland port combinations? Um, I'll answer that this way, uh, Virginia, uh, and I'm a very proud Virginian, uh, but we're a small state. We have about seven and a half million people. We do not have a huge consumption base at all. Um, our big competitor is really the Port of New York, and the population center that is there is just enormous. I mean, they've got people that got to eat and consume stuff every day. We don't have that. Uh, Savannah has the benefit of having Atlanta in their backyard, and that's another huge consumption uh, 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 area. So we've had to artificially create our consumption area, and that's why we've tried to partner with um, uh, you folks here in the Columbus area and capitalize on the Rickenbacker facility and the connectivity and work with the railroads to get to places like that. Um, and so we don't have, you know, we're not gonna grow our state to the size of New York or the size of Atlanta. And so we've got to continue to foster these kinds of, uh, of partnerships and maybe look to other areas, which is why I think that Roanoke opportunity and Pritchard, West Virginia may, may evolve into something. We just started a rail service down to Greensboro, North Carolina. Um, we hope to start maybe another rail service down to Charlotte to chip away at some of that uh, southeast uh, freight um, that is in that sort of um, swing area could go to Virginia, South Carolina, or, or, or Charleston. Um, but those are, the, those are the real challenges uh, that, that, that we face. We don't have that, that population center. I'd say from an airport's perspective, the first airport that comes to mind as a, a giant uh, that we're trying to chip away at is Chicago. I mean, it's obviously a global gateway, and it will be forever, and it's done some smart things. And uh, um, But if we, uh, you know, if we can get uh, some portion of that on a, a lack of congestion uh, closer to your consumers, lower cost uh, message, uh, we'd welcome that. Uh, Atlanta uh, Airport as well, a, a rising star in logistics as well, and competitive. J.J. Schultz, Columbus State uh, faculty with uh, logistics. Thanks for being here. Quick question, what can we in education do to support you all? 
Well, I think you're doing a, a ton, uh, particularly at Columbus State with the logistics art program and, um, and creating training opportunities for the uh, people inside that 40 million in the Rickenbacker area and many millions more in central Ohio. And so, you know, continue to stay focused on helping us with uh, the training requirements and the staffing requirements uh, of, of the industry. And I know you're working closely with Jeff and CRLC and the chamber on, on those initiatives. And I, I find it to be enormously helpful. Of course, Ohio State has the advanced degrees in, in logistics as well and um, you know I think it it's uh, it's helpful both in um, staffing our, our own industry and uh, attracting industry to Columbus uh, on both levels thank you thank you no further questions I take it well I want to thank uh, and the CMC wants to thank Outlook Media and uh, Morpsey for sponsoring our program today. I uh, also want to thank our panel. Jeff, thanks for coming into town and participating. David, uh, thank you as well. Uh, Patty, great job. Thank you. Uh, don't forget to RSVP for next week, the many shades of gray. we got to face it. And, <laughs> and we want you to continue the conversation out in the lobby with coffee and cookies. Thank you for coming today. Come back. Thank you.